Episode 294, James Watson, M.D. Well, hello and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we look into the details in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wolder. And Bert, are you ready for your checkup? I'm certainly ready for my checkup, absolutely. I've got my sleeve rolled up, I'm ready for my blood test. And uh, I've got actually I got my stethoscope on, but I can't hear my heartbeat. I wonder why that. <laughs> well, you got to plug it in. Oh my goodness! I'm sorry. Oops. I always keep it in my pocket so it stays cleaner. <laughs> I've got <laughs> got to put those little things in my ear, right? Well, this should be a fun episode. Once again, we are looking at an old piece of Sherlockian scholarship, and in this case, specifically one that has a. Um, well, a very high ranking to it in terms of being awarded the Morley Montgomery Award. That's the highest award you can get for uh, submitting a an article to the Baker Street Journal. Uh, and this is the episode every month that we call Master's Class because it is a masterful piece of work. So we'll be looking forward to getting into this with you in just a moment. In the meantime, you can find the show notes for this episode at ihose.co slash trifles294. It'll take you directly to this page on our SherlockHolmesPodcast.com website where you can poke around there, look through our back catalog, look through the archives, and uh, generally get a good sense as to what we offer. And part of what we offer is the ability to support the show. For as little as $1 a month, you can help us produce and uh, distribute this program across a variety of podcasting platforms We're coming to you wherever you happen to get podcasts and that's great but we also want to make it available to as many people as possible and you can do that by becoming a patron and just a reminder at the end of every month and at the end of every quarter we have drawings that every one of our patrons is eligible for the monthly drawing is for a free back issue of the baker street journal at random and the quarterly drawing is for a free annual subscription to the baker street journal so make sure you check that out well we're looking at james watson md Hey, wait, shouldn't that be John Watson, MD? <laughs> Something fishy is going on here. Well, look, if you have been with us for a while, uh, first of all, my condolences. Second of all, thank <laughs> you. And third of all, in episode seven, we investigated the James slash John and Mary relationship. It was our, our Valentine's Day episode back in season one of uh, 2017, we looked across a variety of scholarship that guessed why Mary called John Watson James Watson at a certain uh, intersection of the, uh, the canon, I think it was in the, the Man with the Twisted Lip. Well, the good news is our master's class has found yet another supposition, a piece of scholarship along these lines, and it's so good, it was actually awarded the Morley Montgomery Award for 2001. What is it, Bert? Well, the Morley Montgomery Award... Oh, no, you're not asking me <laughs> We that. know that. It, it is a paper called James Watson, M.D. by Thomas Sinken, and like all of our entries in the master's class, what we're trying to do here is connect our listeners to papers that they might not have seen or read or heard of, but also to point out things they might want to employ themselves as they write their own papers for their local science society or the Baker Street Journal or other publications. So it is uh, James Watson, M.D., and it's got a, a wonderful collection of uh, technique here in it. But just to get it started, Thomas Sinken, who wrote this in 2001, starts by focusing right on Watson. And what he tells us is not going to surprise any of our listeners, he goes through a description of Watson, emphasizing the fact that when you make a list of unreliable narrators whose work you have read, John H. Watson might well be at the top of the list. <laughs> well, you know, he makes a good case because right off the bat, the very first two stories we find inconsistencies in Watson's wound. 
We had we had him injured in the shoulder in the very first story, and then limping around in the second one. So uh, you know, very early on, Watson uh, qualifies himself as unreliable. And you know, the thing that interests me about the way Tom approached this, and he he has plenty of examples that he lists throughout the paper. We're not going to go through every single one of them, um, but it's the fact that Watson. Our narrator is the person with whom we spend the most time in the canon. And throughout that decades-long experience, he says, well, you have to imagine these are the ins and outs, the daily um, habits of, of a person. And if you were in that kind of situation, if you were doing a, you know, a journal of your life or trying to recall things from your life and it was part of your daily routine, well, you might get a few things wrong here and there. So it's, it seems like a very uh, easy to understand and human uh, kind of error that we would expect out of something like this. Yeah, it's a very, very good point. And as Tom digs into all of that and puts that down on the page, he makes a quick transition after referring to some of these big inconsistencies some of which, you know, you've just mentioned, and gets into the area of chronology. And he says, you know, if we try to line up the calendar with the key cases that tell us about, for example, Watson's marriage, um, it's kind of confusing. Some of these point to 1887. Um, some of these point to March 1888. And it's just not clear. Yeah, and um, he, he said that the chronologists really haven't focused on another potential milestone case in this category, uh, the Naval Treaty, and this would have been the July immediately after Watson's marriage. Um, he said there's no uh, internal evidence for dating uh, the Naval Treaty, but it does say in the July immediately after Watson's marriage. Uh, it concerned a then-secret treaty signed between Britain and Italy in 1887. And he said this might rightly be added to the weight of evidence suggesting that Watson wed sometime in that year. All right, so he, he squarely places Watson's first marriage, or in some cases, as we've heard it, the first Watson's marriage, in <laughs> 1887, which is ostensibly before the occurrence of the sign of four when Mary Morstan shows up in 1888. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I would just like to point out that so, so far in this paper, what we have is the introduction of an unreliable narrator. We have plenty of evidence and examples of all of that unreliability. And now we've gotten right to Watson's marriage. And the focus here is on Watson's own reporting of events and how that might relate to his marriage. And we see a whole system of inconsistencies. Now, I would like to point out that the question of Watson's marriage isn't really that much of a question because if you uh, take the general dating of the sign of four as 1888, which most chronologists agree upon, and then look at the first publication date of A Scandal in Bohemia, which appeared in the Strand Magazine in um, 1891, 1891 yeah. right? Um, that's where Watson says... Basically, he begins that case by saying, you know, because of my marriage, I hadn't seen very much of Holmes, but I did hear of him do this, that, and the other thing. So clearly, Watson was married sometime between the sign of four in which he meets Mary Morstan and 1891. And most people, for a variety of reasons, including the dating of the great hiatus, Holmes' um, but supposed death at Reichenbach Falls, say to themselves, okay, well then... 1888, 1889, 1891, I hadn't heard much of Holmes. You know, I bet Watson was probably married since he met Mary in 1888 in 1889. Hmm. However, what's going on here in Tom's very clever paper is he's not worried at all about the publication of another case and that published reference by Watson. He's just dealing with the internal evidence of the stories. Yeah, and and the thing is, uh, as he goes through these uh, different theories that various chronologists up until that time had uh, tried to work out, 
he says there's um, there's strong contradictory evidence suggesting two different possible time frames for Watson's marriage. And the the one area in which the brilliant light of logic has illuminated the absolute truth has been the matter of Watson's medical practice, right? <laughs> so Watson Watson is more faithful in in remembering his work life than he is his married life <laughs> evidently. Yes. Um but but uh, he says that um, it, it has shifting locations and changing fortunes, but nothing uh, could be added to uh, one of the chronologists' singular effort to reconcile the data complete in a completely logical progression. And chronologists have much for which to be grateful. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know, at this part of the paper, uh, Tom Thomas introduces another sort of major. Uh, inconsistency, um, you, you know, which is, um, well, actually, he refers to, um, you know, a number of um, other things, but he basically sums all this up and says, you know, Watson's accounts of himself contain so many other inconsistencies that many have, in frustration, unfairly adjudged him either a fool or a drunk. <laughs> well, let's not forget, it's his brother, Henry older brother that was a drunk uh, according <laughs> according to Holmes's analysis when that watch arrived in the sign of four um, but he says perhaps the most intriguing inconsistency is that as many have observed while Mori the Moriarty family appears to have suffered from a strange dearth of given names all those Jameses uh, the Watsons had a remarkable surfeit Holmes's boon companion was called both John in a study in Scarlet, Thorpe Bridge, and James in The Man with the Twisted Lip. Efforts <laughs> to explain away this glaring discrepancy have been highly imaginative. And that's what we covered back in Episode 7. But, Tom writes, as others have noted, have verged on the Hamish. <laughs> Not the Hamish, by the way. <laughs> No, and that uh, that Hamish that Hamish, of course, refers to Dorothy L. Sayers. Miss Sayers proposed that the H was Hamish, which is Scottish for uh, James, and that's why uh, he was called James. But we're not having any of that here. But I thought that's not. very very cute. It was very cute. Hamish. It was. Well, what we are going to have is a quick commercial break, and when we come back, we'll hear how Tom resolves all of these discrepancies. Stay tuned. When you're looking for reference material regarding the Sherlock Holmes stories, the Baker Street Journal has been providing thoughtful articles since 1946. The topics range from the trifling to deep conundrums, but they all center around Sherlockian scholarship. And maybe you've been subscribing for years, or maybe you have yet to subscribe. But there's one resource that can make your research easier to do. The EBSJ. The EBSJ is an electronic copy of all the back issues of the Baker Street Journal from its inception in 1946 through 2011 in PDF format. That's 276 issues with more than 18,000 pages spanning the old series to the new series, the Christmas annuals all the way through 2011. It's entirely searchable, so you can find what you need in just seconds. Check out the EBSJ on BakerStreetIrregulars.com today. All right, we're back jumping into, or back into, I should say, James Watson, M.D., with Thomas Sinken. Uh, he says, in the interest of advancing the debate, we may postulate that the irreconcilable and irreconcilable differences are just that irreconcilable for good reason right the personal history <laughs> of no one individual could contain so many discrepancies particularly when they're autobiographical it stands to reason therefore that the biographical details of more than one person are evident, and the duality of these details across the board is striking. Hmm. 
Yes, and Tom refers to, of course, if you are our listeners, our, our mystery lovers, you'll know the name of Ellery Queen. Ellery Queen was the nom de plume uh, of two cousins, Frederick Dene and, and Manfred Lee, who were both members of the Bakers. Oh, no, Freddie Dene was a member Just of the one, BSI, yeah. but man, yeah. Manny Lee was not. And, and he goes on and says, uh, you know, something like that, where two individuals, most likely Watson and a younger sibling, co-authored the canon while they were in joint medical practice. And that would explain why Watson was so casual about his practice and why he was uh, occasionally turning it over to, air quotes here, a neighbor. Hmm. I like this. I like where he's going with this. Uh, and he says, uh, we must also assume uh, that the uh, the two brothers, uh, the two Watson brothers, that is, collaborated on some cases in assisting Holmes, writing them up, or both, and that some overlap is inevitable. And <laughs> but although we may not expect through this theory to resolve the minutia of the quant- chronological inconsistencies, we're at least able to explain decisively why such anomalies exist. <laughs> yeah, and then he paints us a picture of the two Watson brothers. John Watson, the older brother, late of the British Army, was wounded at my wand, received a wound pension, joined up with Holmes, married Mary Morstan. His younger brother, James, joined the Indian Army. And this is because Watson, in a later case, mistakenly refers to his military experience as being in the Indian Army. Mm. The younger brother joined the Indian Army, was wounded in the leg, returned from India on half pay to London, married someone whom we don't know in 1887. And, um, you know, and, and there you are. John was the bachelor with the experience of women of three continents, James joined his brother as junior partner, first in medical practice and then in assisting Holmes and recounting his adventures when he wrote under his brother's name. Hmm. That's <laughs> it. And he said this, this arrangement would certainly go far in explaining why Watson was always confident about being able to rely on short notice upon his quote-unquote neighbor to shoulder his caseload. His sibling junior partner was always at hand. Aha. Uh-huh. We might further speculate that James's landlady was Mrs. Turner, <laughs> whose establishment was in some fashion closely linked to that of Mrs. Hudson. And other discrepancies are uh, just as readily explained, writes uh, Thomas. Uh, he says it was James who, with more time in the military, accurately described himself as an old campaigner and the man with the twisted lip and uh, the Boscombe Valley mystery. It was also he who worked with Holmes in the Valley of Fear, leaving John to learn of Moriarty later. (laughs) And who spent fewer years assisting Holmes than had his older sibling as enumerated in the Veiled Lodger. (laughs) Yeah, so, you know, you really have to appreciate and applaud what Tom Thomas is very cleverly done here, which is sort of like shuffling a deck of cards with a chess set. You know, you start out <laughs> with you start out with all of Watson's uh, misstatements and his his unreliability, and then go to chronology and just focus on the cases, and then sort of tee up this uh, wonderful answer. And he says at uh, at the conclusion of all of this, um, you know, John and James would not have bothered really with any particular effort to eliminate any traces of their respective uh, appearances in the case. So when James's wife called him James, he didn't think anything of it. (laughs) And he says, perhaps neither should we. (laughs) However, I am left, and that's that's the way the uh, the paper concludes, and it's it's an excellent, masterful a uh, piece of work, which is why it's part of master's class here. But the question I have is when the two of these military men returned with their pensions, one half pay having been uh, invalided out, why didn't they share a room together? <laughs> well, I think that is just a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles.
Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You've taken my breath away, Mr. Holmes. Before my biographer came to glorify me. You mean you have records of your early work?